Hi there everybody. What I'm going to be doing today is uh, looking at creating my own mini waterless garden system. When I was out in Australia on the Divine Truth Volunteer Training Program, I was present at a talk that Peter Litton Hitchens gave at his home discussing the principles behind creating a self-maintaining waterless garden system and also the uh, equipment and the things that we'll need to create such a system at home. I'm going to go on a few little trips around London to find all the material that I need to create this system and uh, hopefully I can put a video together showing you all how I've gone about doing this so if you're interested uh, you can maybe go about creating one of these yourself too. I just thought before I uh, I go get some materials uh, for the waterless garden to uh, just take a trip and a bit of a walk around Hampstead Heath um, to talk a little bit about why I feel uh, waterless gardens are important. Firstly, when I say waterless garden, I don't mean a garden that doesn't need water. What I mean is a garden that doesn't need to be watered by ourselves in order to grow. One of the first things I learned in Australia was where uh, Jesus mentioned to us all that actually um, if we watered our own garden it's actually out of harmony with the principles of God and God's love. At first I thought oh that was interesting because I was always under the assumption that you know we had to water our own garden in order for it to survive and maintain itself. When I was a child my parents always used to you know maintain the garden, used to water the plants and the flowers um, and things like that and I saw that growing up so I just thought that was normal. Jesus uh, suggests that a lot of our kind of processes or emotions that we put into our own personal gardens are quite addictive or addictive in nature because we almost create a dependency on uh, on a garden so we give a lot to the garden and then as a result we've encouraged this uh, dependency that the garden then has on us so that then draws further energy and time out of us to maintain it and uh, Jesus said that God obviously doesn't do this, you know, with God's creations. Another reason why I'm experimenting with uh, creating or trying to create my own mini waterless garden system at home is because I want to try and grow um, some plants or some herbs. I'm 27 years old and uh, I've not actually ever grown any of my own plants or try growing any of my own food. And when I reflect upon my granddad's life um, he was born in part of Serbia or Croatia and he was from a little village 70 80 years ago uh, particularly in villages people were more focused on growing their own things and they were more self responsible um, whereas now particularly people my generation we've come become used to just going into supermarkets and getting our fruit and vegetable really easily and so we don't really appreciate or think much about being actually self-responsible and growing our own things and I feel that's a real big issue now in the world uh, particularly with the new technology advancements and things like that you know you see two three year olds perfectly knowing the way around an iPad and things like that whereas you know the real basics and the things which give you actually real true pleasure I'm finding such as you know working with nature and growing your own fruit and vegetables you can't compare the two I do feel quite excited of the prospect of trying to grow my own herbs just because I've never really done it before but also it's exciting because I'd like to see what other conclusions I can draw from the experiment you know I've heard Jesus say that you know, our plants that we grow or any fruit that we grow, any food, uh, they, the, the growth and the goodness of the growth is dependent upon our own personal emotions. So if we have any addictions or any demands that we place on the plant itself, the plant will feel that and the plant will then reflect um, the condition of within our own hearts, within our souls, and it will affect the growth of the plant and the abundance of the plant itself. This is another thing I would like to experiment with that I haven't experimented with before. By documenting that and uh, reflecting further, it will help me to understand more about the higher laws. So the actual laws to do with the soul, um, the divine laws, and seeing how you know these lessons with nature or things we observe in nature 
uh, can be attributed also to our soul and soul growth. I've collected all the materials that I need to create this mini waterless garden system. What I'm going to do now is show all you guys these materials. A small bag of washed gravel, water absorbent felt, a 35 litre bag of vegan organic multi-purpose compost, seeds of four different types of uh, herb, five times 1.5 litre plastic jars, plastic tubing with the diameter of five millimetres, plastic tube connectors also with a diameter of five millimetres, a water mister, a small bottle of silicone sealant, scissors, a tape measure, a marker pen, a battery drill. There are five principles that we're going to follow to create this waterless garden. The first principle is the water reservoir. So to begin this, we're going to need five empty uh, plastic bottles or jars. I actually got these from a sweet shop in town. Uh, luckily, uh, the lady who owned the place had a few spare ones knocking around. Now the capacity on the ones I have here are 1.5 liters. However, you can go anywhere between 750 mil to probably 1.5 liters um, it's not too important it really just depends on how big uh, you want your garden in previous attempts of trying this uh, which i've had quite a few now that have failed um, these these types of plastic jars or bottles are best although you might not be able to see at home uh, this uh, these plastic bottles are quite thick the plastics are good quality uh, because the previous times I've tried doing this, I've used uh, the standard water bottles that you get in a local store and I found that the plastic's really thin and it's not really good quality. So I actually found that when I was trying to make uh, these holes in, into, into those plastic bottles, that um, the actual plastic cracked and it produced leaks, which is like, like the worst thing possible actually to, to do. Um, so I've actually gone for these um, and also another cool thing is that this type of plastic is PET uh, plastic and that means that uh, for food and other things it, uh, it doesn't release toxins over time so a lot of plastic if it isn't PET then you know that's probably not a good idea to use because over time the toxins from the plastic will go into you know the soil or the water system here and then that could affect your plants or your growth so try as well to look for PET plastic if possible so I'm just going to put these to the side for a second and we're going to begin by creating a water tank for this bottle we're going to be drilling one hole uh, with this battery drill it is a lot easier if you do have a battery drill um, you can try and puncture it with maybe uh, one blade of a scissor um, but you know that could be tricky and it could maybe even crack plastic so you know luckily for me I do have a battery drill and I'm going to use this to create a hole the hole I'm going to be creating is for a little plastic connector what we're going to be doing is basically pushing this through the hole that we drill uh, to create like a, a mini kind of water valve system and I'm going to be consistent in drilling um, the holes in each of the bottles at the same height from the base so this is why it's important as well to go for consistency with whatever type of plastic bottle you use or jar use the exact same for each uh, for each one for the whole thing because water it does sit at level and you know if you have a different diameter um, different diameter plastic uh, bottles or different shape or different size it will affect where the water sits in each one I'm going to use the battery drill and just drill a hole exactly to that point that I've just marked Be very careful when you are making this hole. You don't want to force the drill too much, otherwise you could crack the plastic bottle or the plastic jar and that wouldn't be good. Also, what I found a lot easier in my previous failed experiments is that if you leave the, um, the actual lid on the bottle, it makes the, 
the whole drilling or making the hole easier because of the air pressure. Another cool little tip that Pete Litton Hitchens showed us in Australia when he demonstrated this to us in his home was that each and every plastic bottle or plastic jar will have a join line that goes all the way up it and this is where the plastic was kind of joined together when it was made so it is actually easier to puncture a hole particularly if you don't have a drill if you do it on that central line or on that join line. What I'm gonna do is just push this through the hole that I've just drilled. One really important thing again with drilling the hole is to make the hole slightly smaller than the actual connector that you have because if you do it this way and you push it through, it will ensure a tighter fit and also lessens the chance of having leaks. I've been experimenting early today and my fingers are quite sore from doing this a number of times and trying to find the best way. So I'm just gonna try and push it through. I haven't gone the full way. There's a groove on the connector, but I found through previous experiments that if I push that through more, uh, it actually creates a hole that's too big for the actual fitting of the connector and the water then falls out and there's a leak. What I will do is paste links in the description box at the bottom of this video to websites where I managed to purchase all of the materials that I've used just so that anybody at home, particularly if you live in the UK, um, can find things relatively quickly. And some things haven't worked, some things have. So I just want to save as much time for everyone at home um, so you guys can try it a lot easier and you don't have to use as much money and go for as many experiments as I've done. We're going to do the exact same thing that we just did with the water tank that I just showed you. Uh, same point, same mark in the actual bottle itself. Um, however, for two of, the, two of the remaining four bottles, we're actually going to put in two uh, plastic connectors, one on each side of the plastic bottle. So we're going to have two uh, connectors, one there, one there, one there, one there. And then for the other two, we're just going to have one connector copy exactly what we just did on that water tank. So we're going to have just one there and one there. But once we've done that, you should have the water tank. So one plastic jar with one entry point. Then a further two uh, plastic jars, again, with one entry point in each. And then two plastic jars with two entry points, one on each side of the plastic bottle. The next step is to cut and place this tubing on the plastic connectors so that the whole system is linked. What I've got here is a five mil plastic tubing. What I'm gonna do now is just cut a bit of tubing um, that will go from the uh, water tank to a T-piece uh, plastic connector. So at one end of the plastic tube, I'm gonna place this uh, plastic connector. I'm gonna put it in such a way so that when I push it in, there are two uh, release points for the water. Attach this other end into the plastic connector that we've already attached. What I've done with the previous plastic connectors is I've join them in such a way so the T point here is facing upwards um, obviously making sense because if it's facing sideways or down then water is going to come out of it and I actually couldn't find just a standard two-way connector anywhere so this is why I've done this. What I'm going to do now is cut some more tubing for the rest of the bottles and then I'll show you afterwards what we have. So now we're going to connect the whole system together with the water tank, which we'll place in the middle. We're going to connect the tubing that still needs connecting from two of the plastic bottles to this connector here. And then we're going to connect the remaining two plastic jars. Should have the central water tank, which is now connected through the plastic connectors and the plastic tubing to the remaining four other plastic jars. Test the system for leaks. However, before I do that, I'm just going to actually use a bit of uh, silicone sealant that I got from the local hardware store 
and just go around each of the uh, plastic connector points in each of the plastic bottles on the outside just to make sure that it is sealed. I'm just going to pour some water into the uh, water reservoir or the water tank in this situation. So what I'm going to do now is just sit here for 20-25 minutes to look for any leakages that may be occurring in the system. But it's important to leave this going for at least 20-25 minutes just so we can see the water flown into the furthest two uh, plastic jars as well. It takes time for the water to cook to go from the central reservoir to fill up the closest two uh, plastic jars and then for the furthest two to be filled up from what's coming through from the central container. <laughs> Once the water levels have evened themselves out across all of the different plastic jars and we've checked that there are no leaks in the system, we can then tip all of the water out and begin with the next step. This first step or principle is the uh, water reservoir principle and it is probably the most important principle. The second principle that the waterless garden system is based upon is the uh, overflow uh, system or the overflow mechanism is a step in place if there's too much water in the system it can be removed so drying doesn't occur for our plants later on. In this system um, quite simply um, the way to um, actually control the overflow is with the uh, central reservoir so the water tank if the water gets too high we can just simply tip some out of the top. Okay, so, so far we've covered the first two principles in creating the waterless garden. The first being the central reservoir system, the second being the overflow. The third principle is called the wicking system. A wicking system basically is a system whereby water can travel from one place to another, usually against the force of gravity, through a scientific process called capillary action. And that's just where water molecules, they like to stick together and so if you have some kind of material such as paper or felt, the water um, will travel from the bottom of that felt or the paper towel and slowly travel its way up. So th this is what we're essentially gonna be creating here. I'm gonna put the central reservoir away because we don't need that at the moment. And I'm gonna begin by cutting this bag of gravel open and adding it to the four other plastic jars. Although the gravel is above the, uh, the entry point for where the water will be flowing into each of the plastic jars, uh, this won't be a problem and the water will still be able to get to the felt layer because of the capillary action. The water will actually be able to travel its way up through the gravel and into the felt layer. Okay, so it's time to now add the felt. I've placed the felt that I've just cut into the jar and I've cut it in such a way so that there's plenty of, of the felt in there and it goes up the sides of the plastic jar. An important thing to remember with the felt when you add your felt layer or uh, some kind of material that you find can absorb, and absorb water well and allow for the capillary action to take place is to make sure that the felt is in contact with the gravel because when the water comes in it's going to travel up the gravel and then be absorbed into the felt. I can't actually remember what Pete did with his felt in his experiment at home. I don't know whether he just placed a simple felt layer on top of the gravel and that was it or if he actually had a similar uh, thing going on is what I have here where this felt going up the sides of the plastic jar as well What I've just done is I'm going to try this method with the with the felt going up the side uh, Just to see how it works because at the end of the day. This is all experimentation anyway, so we'll just see what happens I'm going to do the exact same for the remaining three plastic jars the cool thing with this felt layer is that it doesn't have to be uh, you know something specifically gardening related either in terms of the material that you use. Pete mentioned that you can experiment with this and use things like old like cotton shirts or any kind of material where it allows water to actually be absorbed into it firstly 
and secondly so that the water can kind of travel up uh, up the material itself you can just use something that you find knocking around that does the job too one cool thing i thought of whilst i was adding my felt layer to each of the four jars was i could have experimented with trying four different materials to allow for the wicking system uh, or the wicking effect to occur in the jars and i could have easily measured this afterwards to see the growth rate for example of the uh, of the actual plants that i that i'll grow that's the wicking system in place principle three just to recap We've got the gravel layer at the bottom of the base, some kind of absorbent water um, felty type material directly sitting on top of the gravel. And so there is a connection point between the gravel and the felt. They are touching and it is important that they do touch um, just to allow the actual wicking effect to take place inside the plastic jars. So really the whole point to the wicking system is to allow the water, once it flows into each jar, to transport up through the different layers, so through the gravel layer into the felt layer and ultimately then absorbed into the soil, which we're now gonna put in. The fourth principle is soil. Now, I've got here a 35 liter vegan friendly multi-purpose uh, peat-free organic compost, which I'm now gonna put into each of the four uh, plastic jars and I'm going to do it in such a way so that the soil starts from the bottom of the felt layer and works its way up evenly to the top of each jar. Pete was saying in Australia and I found through doing my own research that a lot of uh, compost that you can buy in general hardware stores etc aren't vegan friendly. A lot of them do have um, animal bones crushed and blood, animal blood, or crushed into the actual mixture. You do have to make sure if you are wanting to do this vegan, um, the most loving way possible, that you do kind of look out for that. I actually got this relatively cheap. I think it was around uh, 11, 11 pounds for this massive 35 litre bag online. And it got delivered really quickly, so I'm really happy with that. What I'm gonna do now is just add the soil into each of the four plastic jars. I've added the uh, vegan compost, the soil, to each of the four plastic jars. And what I'm gonna do before I sow my uh, seeds into the soil is uh, reconnect all the tubing back together and put some water into the central reservoir just to get the soil moist. It's a bit dry because it has been in that bag for a while. I wanna get the soil a bit moisty and uh, the system with some water in it before I do plant the seed just to give the seed the best possible environment to start germinating from and grow. I've chosen to try and grow four different types of herb. First one is uh, basil, second one coriander, third chives, fourth oregano. All of the seeds that I'm going to be sowing into the soil are all organic. One thing that is going to be very interesting for me is to see how well or if the seeds even grow in this this is the first time i've actually done it myself i have had a few failed attempts before i got the camera out and that actually leads me on to the fifth principle of waterless gardens and that is actually our own emotions so the emotions within each of our souls that affects the growth of plants jesus says a lot of times in a lot of uh, divine truth videos that our soul has an effect on every living organism in our environment and vicinity. Of the four uh, herbs that is probably my favorite, I'd have to say coriander. It would be very interesting for me to see the growth rate of the coriander plant in comparison with the other three, just because Jesus says that based on our emotional investment or if we have any demands on uh, a certain type of plant to grow, particularly if it's something like one of our favorite uh, plants, it would be interesting to observe and document how that plant grows. And it is a reflection of potential demands we have within our souls that does affect the growth rate of the actual plant. It's very exciting. I'm really looking forward to seeing how, how that goes and how each of the four different uh, plants grow. Once I sowed the herb seeds into each of the plastic jars, 
What I'm gonna do for the first few days is just use a uh, water sprayer just to spray the top part of the soil just because obviously it's gonna take a while for the water to come up through the different layers and be absorbed into the soil because the soil at the top is furthest away from the point of where the water is gonna be coming in. I am just gonna give it a bit of a spray on top just to uh, get the water and get the soil moist there. I'm gonna try and document the growth of each of the four plants uh, just to see how effective this system actually is. If the coriander plant grows super quick and it's really healthy and growing really well and better than the other three, then that's awesome. Like that must be a good thing. If the coriander plant is not doing good at all compared to the other three, there's some stuff in, in me that is affecting the growth of that. My suspicion is it may be the second but we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, I'm going to document all of that and do a short follow-up video. Just to recap, there are five principles that I use to build this waterless garden system that Pete showed us in Australia. The first is the central reservoir. Second is the overflow. Third is the wicking system. Fourth is the soil. The fifth principle are our own emotions within our soul that affect the growth of the plants. Here is what the jars now look like when they're fully filled up. There's the gravel layer that fills up about a third of the plastic jar. You've got the felt layer and the, you can see there, there's a brown part and that's not soil, it's just the felt has actually now got water in it. There's moisture there. It has traveled some distance up the felt. And then on top of that, is the organic vegan compost. And also I planted the seeds in there too. One really important thing that I forgot to mention earlier on, and that is with the wicking system, don't go more than 300 milliliters between the reservoir and the soil level. Don't leave more than a 300 milliliter gap between where the water comes in to the plastic container and to where eventually it would be absorbed into the soil through the felt material. Pete mentioned this to us in Australia and he did say it's really important because you don't want to kind of leave too much gap, uh, make it harder for the water molecules to actually go through into the soil level uh, through the capillary action uh, process. The, the materials used uh, can vary, you know, we don't all have to use the same materials. The most important thing is that we understand the principles and try and create the waterless garden on the principles. The materials are just things that we can use as tools to help um, incorporate the principles into the creation. So some things that I used in this video, you may not be able to find if you live in, let's say the States or other countries around the world. And it's just a case of kind of going into your own local hardware stores and trying to find things or tools or materials that will help you create something that actually is underpinned by the principles itself. Because this is my first time doing this experiment and I don't know how it's gonna go, I'm not sure about the amount of time or frequency uh, that I would be needing to add more water to the central uh, water tank or the water reservoir to keep it topped up. As it is a waterless garden, hopefully I wouldn't need to do this much at all. If I remember in Australia when Pete showed us his, his, he's, I think he mentioned he only had to add a bit more water, I think once in the space of two or three weeks. Um, so that's pretty good. For his uh, system, he, I believe, kept it indoors on a windowsill. So he didn't actually, you know, put his system outside. So it didn't get any rain or anything like that. So he also grew, um, I think, basil and coriander plants. Uh, he didn't actually start it from uh, the seed. Uh, I think what he did was he actually uh, bought um, uh, basil and coriander plants that already had germinated and they were quite small. I think he bought them and then transported them or transplanted them, sorry, into, uh, into the soil of his waterless garden. But I'm doing this one a bit differently. I'm actually sowing the seeds themselves and seeing how long it takes and also seeing the growth. So although it is going to take probably a bit longer, um, you know, I'm, I'm not in a rush at all. I'm interested to see how this all goes. And yeah, I mean, as it's my first time, I have absolutely no idea how this is going to go at all. A cool thing that Pete shared with us uh, when he uh, demonstrated to us his waterless garden that he created was that all the water that 
he puts into the water reservoir or the water tank, it is all self-contained within the whole system itself. So no water is wasted or lost. Also, because of the way uh, the mini waterless garden has been created and designed, is that the water kind of comes in through the bottom and it goes up. So what Pete was saying was that that may actually assist in uh, developing a really strong uh, and robust root system. Instead of the water obviously coming down, let's say, for example, through rain, you know, uh, coming from the sky down to the ground, it's coming from the top down. So it takes more time for the water to get down into the roots and into the soil. Whereas in this method, the water is actually coming from the bottom up. And so hopefully that would encourage the roots to grow quicker and stronger. Another really important thing that I heard um, while I was out there in Australia with some of the guys was that if we know these principles and experiment with them, in small scale experiments such as this mini waterless garden that I've just shown you guys today, we can basically apply the same principles uh, but to a much larger scale. So in this example, we could use much larger um, plastic uh, containers, bigger tubes, uh, there'll be more water in the system, which ultimately would provide hopefully uh, bigger uh, plants. The great thing is that it would be uh, a lot more self-maintaining, something that could be relatively easily looked after. We wouldn't have to put that much energy into maintaining the whole system. The real um, kind of job really is kind of understanding the principles and um, setting it up first. But once it has been set up first and that hard work's been done, uh, we can then kind of just keep an eye on things and see how it goes. Because I'm relatively new um, and inexperienced with all of this kind of stuff, growing uh, plants and the environment and you know all of these new things for me, I don't know potentially where this thing could lead. Maybe we could kind of, as humankind, um, grow or set huge waterless gardens up um, so farmers could potentially set huge systems up where they can, you know, uh, grow tons of uh, food in a in a really economical and loving way for everybody. Um, but also as well, um, it would be a lot easier on the farmers too. As Jesus has said uh, a number of times on uh, certain videos and also whilst we're in, this, in Australia, uh, God doesn't pay special attention to you know, one forest over another, uh, whereas us humans do kind of pay special attention to our own garden and not forests and things like that. You know, a lot of people don't, you know, water their local forest or whatever, but we kind of spend a lot of time watering our own garden. And um, really, that's not an ethical thing because we're loving one thing over another. And then really, can we even say that that's love at all? Um, you know, like really, if we are loving, then we would all love everything equally. Um, I mean, I'm nowhere near, you know, that kind of level of love at all at the moment. Really, who wouldn't um, not want to create a waterless garden if, uh, you know, we knew how to do it? You know, it would give us way more time to spend doing other things. Um, you know, we could put our energy into things we really enjoy doing as well. You know, so if we enjoy uh, music or art or, you know, other things, we can spend more time doing that. And a lot of our energy is drained into, you know, doing things such as looking after creations that we've already created. Um, and one thing that I did learn in Australia at the recent uh, Divine Truth um, assistance group was about the uh, economy principle and that if we are in harmony with, this principle of God's that all of our creations are self-maintaining pretty much and we don't need to keep putting effort and energy into keeping things going um, and really if we find that we are having to put more effort um, into almost maintaining something more effort even than the time and energy it took us to create it in the first place it's almost like a negative uh, law of compensation effect happening on our souls 
because we actually created the thing in a flawed way in the first place. Um, and I think that's maybe what um, God is trying to show us with things uh, in all aspects of our life as well. In the description box below the video, I've also included two uh, ecosystem talks that Jesus gave in Australia a couple of years ago. So if you are new to Divine Truth or if you are new to the whole idea of creating loving ecosystems to help recover and repair the land, then you can easily follow these links. I'd like to thank Peter Litton Hitchens for inviting me to his presentation on waterless gardens the principles behind setting up a waterless garden that he shared with us and also for him demonstrating the entire process. I'd like to thank Jesus for also preparing and presenting a few talks whilst we were in Australia on uh, ecosystems. He spoke a little bit about the situation the earth is currently in and how mankind over the centuries has worsened the uh, condition of the earth quite substantially over time. On top of this, Jesus also spoke about different techniques and principles and ways in which we can experiment with and create certain things, such as even a waterless garden system that can help bring back or recover the environment and, uh, and bring the intelligence back into all these living systems. Over time, if humankind does want to look at doing this then we've got ways in which we can do it one thing that i've uh, been finding is that you'll never find one person who says they don't like nature they don't like being in nature it's something that we all have a feeling of joy when we experience and so i feel it's really important we all look at ways in which we can help to get things to how god originally created them to be